the atomic age started with the dropping of a bomb. Let's all hope and pray that it won't end with the same event. The uh, reaction of the President of the United States, Harry Truman, when, was that we've got to make a blessing out of this awful thing. And that began America's uh, greatest public guilt trip, uh, which has continued on through the decades. I think if you were not alive at that time, as I was, you would not fully appreciate the enormity of the genuineness of the guilt trip. I mean, uh, rather than debating whether we should or shouldn't have dropped the bomb, uh, no one uh, wanted to talk about that at the time, uh, but we were deluged uh, with the most uh, vivid descriptions of how this awesome power, uh, this almost godlike power, would be turned uh, to the use of the benefit of mankind. Uh, I, I think it's useful to examine some of the words that were said. For example, the uh, Robert Hutchins, who was the chancellor of the University of Chicago, uh, where a lot of the Manhattan Project research was done, uh, said the following, from atomic energy, heat will be so plentiful that it will even be used to melt snow as it falls. A very few in individuals working a few hours a day at very easy tasks in the general atomic power plants will provide all the heat, light, and power required by the community, and, th and those utilities will be so cheap in their costs to hardly be uh, made to matter at all. Uh, the science writer, Scripps Howards, in 45 said, all transportation forms will be freed at once from the limits now put upon them by the weight of present fuels. The privately owned airplane now suitable only for cross country hopping will fly across the Atlantic. There would be no difficulty in building passenger and cargo airplanes of any desired size uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they, they talked about filling the gasoline tank of your automobile rather than two times a week, once a year with a pellet of atomic energy the size of a vitamin pill. The day will be gone when nations will fight for oil. Large pellets will be used to turn the wheels of industry and then they do, they will turn the era of atomic energy into the age of plenty. And it went on and on and on. And people believed it. Uh, it was a euphoric era. Uh, truth of the matter, at the same time, uh, David Lilienthal, the head of the AEC, had a report to Harry Truman that the, uh, about the time the Russians put off their bomb that we had no stockpile. And so if you read all through David Lilienthal's journals when he was head of the AEC, there was never any discussion of civilian nuclear power uh, they were in the arms race, and they were talking about the hydrogen bomb, and it was all about armaments, and all this talk about this idyllic world was just talk, and the very bright uh, scientists that uh, built the bomb, they went back to their secure positions in universities mostly, and they didn't get down and dirty with things like pipes and pumps and things like that that had to be developed uh, for a reactor. It, it took Hyman Rickover, actually, uh, to, uh, who was a hands-on Navy guy uh, working with a uh, private company that developed the Nautilus, which was the first a actual uh, civilian application of nuclear power. And you have to remember that in a submarine is always in water, so there was no problem of cooling water and there was no problem of cost. Uh, he made it right, but the costs were just astronomical, and so the, the application had no validity to the civilian uh, nuclear power program, but it did give people a basis for thinking that perhaps all these dreams about nuclear power uh, had some validity to it. Uh, you know, 
So we went through this euphoric uh, period that lasted through the 40s and uh, into the 50s. And, and then, then we, we got into uh, an era where the research wasn't producing anything. And uh, frankly, uh, the AEC people knew that they weren't anywhere near a civilian reactor, but they kept uh, making all these grandiose promises in order to get money uh, from the Congress to continue their weapons program, to be quite frank with you about it. Uh, and then uh, events started happening. Uh, the Congress passed, uh, you know, uh, the Price-Anderson Act in 1957, I think it was, uh, which, which really was the beginning of the civilian nuclear power program. Uh, and, and they tr had some research reactors that didn't work out very well. No one paid much attention. But the big uh, breakthrough was in 63, I think it was, when General Electric made a bid for the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant, and they bid at a price just under the price of coal. And of course, the AEC and all these people hail this as the beginning of the commercialization of nuclear power. Well, it was a loss leader bid, if there ever was one. Uh, they, the GE had no idea what that nuclear power plant was going to cost. All they decided as a corporation, it was time to start selling them. And they had a turnkey deal at a price that uh, made it competitive. But that price was way under what turned out to be the cost, and it ushered in the era of the cost overrun. And so these plants were built or sold at a price that looked like it was competitive with coal. But let's just understand this. There has never been a nuclear power plant built that was cost competitive in this country or anywhere else. It just had never happened. This is, this is a technology whose middle name is cost overrun. And it's last name and first name, too, if you want to be really honest about it. Uh, and, and so all of a sudden, uh, what looked like a dormant option that had just gotten a lot of lip service uh, began to be uh, quite the rage. And, uh, you know, I, I can remember uh, personally uh, that uh, I was had left the F Federal Power Commission. I was in law practice in the mid-60s, and the General Electric Company came to my little law firm and asked us to help them figure out how to create a public power agency in, in uh, New Jersey because they wanted to build a half a dozen nuclear reactors right there on one site. Uh, fortunately, the lawyers in GE said they'd be violating the antitrust laws and put a stop to it. But that was the mindset. It was so prevalent that a year later, the Peabody Coal Company came to our law firm and said that they were so afraid of nuclear power taking over the future, they didn't think the coal resources in the West would ever be developed, and they wanted to create public power agencies with low interest money uh, that could make the coal cheaper so they might have a chance of competing. Uh, it was, uh, Glenn Seaborg said, he didn't say it was probable, he said it was a certainty that nuclear power was going to be the wave of the future, and most people believed him. Uh, I, I personally found out how bad it was when I took over the Tennessee Valley Authority under Jimmy Carter in 76, I had found the TVA had stopped doing any maintenance work on its coal plants uh, for years. They were going all nuclear. They had an armada, I would call it, of about 12 nuclear reactors that they had built, and they were just riding off their coal plants. I, we put a billion dollars into putting scrubbers and pollution control equipment on those coal plants. Then if we hadn't, TVA would have blacked out because there were times in the future when all of their nukes were down. Uh, but anyhow, the mindset in those years uh, was that this was, this was uh, the wa wave of the future. But mind you, that there never was a single one of these nuclear power plants whose ultimate cause was anywhere near competitive with other sources of power. 
And the other thing to remember is that the old AEC had the dual role of being of promoting nuclear power it's in the statute as well as regulating it. And you know what took first place. It was the promotion. In fact, they suppressed all sorts of documents from their staff raising safety questions. So the issue of safety about nuclear power was not in the public domain as we went through this euphoric era in the 60s of, of just about everybody and their uncle ordering a nuclear power plant. At the same time, uh, Glenn Seaborg, the head of the AEC, had gone to 60 different nations in, in, the, in the 50s. Uh, remember the most famous speech of Dwight David Eisenhower as president was the Atoms for Peace speech he gave to the UN uh, on December 8th, I think it was, 1953. And then as a result of that, we peddled the idea of the peaceful atom all over the world. And Seaborg was the main salesman. And I remember when, the first time I went to Israel, and I asked them why in the name of heaven they were considering building an atomic power plant in the state of Israel. It would just be a Trojan horse. And I told and they said, well, Ben-Gurion told us that if you didn't have atomic energy, you weren't a modern nation. And that was really the mindset that, the, that we created. It was sold, it was made in America, it was sold in, by America all over the world. Uh, now we face a new dilemma. Having sold the world on what supposedly was the peaceful atom, we find there ain't no such thing. That the road to the bomb is the nuclear power plant. And here we are in a confrontation with Iran and North Korea uh, who are just really implementing the program uh, that America sold to the world. And how in the name of common sense uh, can we expect the nations of the world to support us in trying to uh, stop these countries uh, from building bombs when we ourselves are promoting nuclear power? But it, it is, uh, you know, it is the height of, of hypocrisy and it's hypocrisy that I think we don't even have a mirror in which we see because arrogance seems to have wiped out uh, any mirror on our part. And, and, you know, everybody that knows anything about it knows that not only can you enrich uranium a bit more and make a bomb, but you can reprocess the spent fuel and the plutonium is the ingredients of the bomb. And uh, this administration is actually trying to reverse Jimmy Carter's uh, ban on reprocessing so that uh, we're in a situation where we don't uh, see ourselves at all. But there has been one thing that has been constant throughout the whole era of nuclear power is that it's never been economic, never. Not then, not yesterday, not today, and not tomorrow. And what we're finding with even with, these, with the latest round of so-called new and improved versions, uh, that the first thing you find out is there's a cost overrun of a billion or two dollars. And, and, and the big difference is this. Uh, 30 years ago, when we went on this nuclear binge, we did not have, it was the alternative source of power. Believe me, I remember receiving a petition from the Sierra Club back in the 60s advocating nu clean nuclear power in lieu of some dam that was being proposed in the West. Uh, but we did not have photovoltaic cells. We did not have wind power. We did not understand that you could store electricity uh, when the sun shines and use it when the sun's not shining, etc. We did not have the alternative technologies that are truly sustainable and clean. And so we, we have a whole new situation on our hands. And quite frankly, I'm going to uh, feel I'm old enough to uh, conclude what I have to say with a kind of a Dutch uncle talk to us folks. I want to abolish sarcasm from the anti-nuclear movement. It doesn't help. It really doesn't. 
Uh, you know, there is a law of physics among human beings. If you insult somebody, they want to insult you back. It doesn't make them any smarter, and it doesn't persuade them one bit. It just persuades them that you're kind of goofy. And it, it, it hasn't made a difference. We've tried sarcasm and clown suits and stuff like that for 30 or 40 years, and it hadn't. The only impact it's made is to make us seem like we're a fringe group and make them seem like they're mainstream when it's just the opposite. Uh, it, it is true that this stuff is inherently the most fearsome thing on earth. Uh, but we don't talk about the part of it that I think most people can relate to the most. I mean, the average American, and we, I've been deeply involved in the fight against San Onofre, the, deep, the average American thinks that a power plant that's been sitting there for 25 years and apparently hadn't hurt anybody from what they can tell, nobody's really complained about it, isn't all of a sudden a killer. But I tell you what does impress people. When you tell them there's 30 years of radioactive trash that's piled up in their backyard and hadn't been taken care of and we don't have any place to put it, that polls 75%. We've done some polling. Uh, people are more upset and afraid of the radio, and you need to call it radioactive trash. Nobody on earth knows what spent fuel is. With all due respect to my friend Alvarez and all the scientists that talk about this stuff, unless we start using plain English, we're talking to ourselves. Now, the stuff... The, the stuff is radioactive trash sitting there in a swimming pool, and if they lose the water, you got a damn fire, the equivalent of a bomb. And we ought to be talking like that. Uh, I mean, fear is a pretty strong factor. Uh, and, and, and people uh, really relate to the idea that we don't have any place to put this stuff. And you, you tell them that it's been 50 years and they haven't figured out a safe place to put it, it does suggest that we might even get a, a majority of people in this country in favor of birth control, controlling the birth of a more radioactive trash because we don't know where to put it. And, and, and that, is, that is the strongest argument that I've been able to find to persuade people that we ought to shut down the nuclear reactors that are operating because it is immoral. Uh, I think, and a lot of people will agree that it is immoral to make more stuff that you don't know what to do with and just let it sit there for future generations to deal with. And no one has ever talked about the cost of just monitoring this trash for a million years. I realize that on a present value basis in the world of economics that nothing 30 years from now is worth anything, but most people don't really believe that. And, and, and I don't think we put enough emphasis on the fact that we should not uh, be making more of this stuff. And the stuff that we have, we need to put it into dry concrete casts and leave it where it is. Uh, because the idea that there is some place somewhere that is safe ignores anything that knows anything about geology and the fact that the earth just changes all the time. It's a way of taking the stuff out of sight and out of mind, and it's kind of like putting uh, dirt under your carpet at home. It doesn't remove it, it just hides it. And then you don't even see it and you don't know when it's gonna bite you. So I think that the, the cost issue uh, the uh, radioactive trash issue are the ones uh, that really we can hammer home. And we have to first recognize that we have lost the movement. Uh, we, that we are a few patriotic souls here that get together every once in a while and say the same things to each other over and over again. Uh, but there is no, there is no anti-nuclear movement in this country today. We have lost connection with the American people. Uh, Three Mile Island uh, killed the nuclear industry for 20 or 30 years, but it is not dead. And there's 150 reactors uh, lying all over the country as radioactive sleeping dogs that can erupt if there's an earthquake or a human accident. And thus far, we're seeing one of these things about every 10 years, and there's no reason to think that that cycle is, is going away. Uh, but we're not, we're not winning the argument 
on the safe on the safety issue of the plant, and I don't think we'll win it uh, all by itself. There's an old expression that says that you can't beat something with nothing, and too much of our verbiage is negative and uh, anti. Uh, we need to form a very very strong. 100% renewable movement in this country and, and, and get together and let people know that we don't have to choose between carbon and plutonium. We can damn well get rid of both. And, and, and to, to the extent that we're not doing that, uh, we're just, uh, I think, not wasting time but we're just uh, beating our head up against the same wall over and over again. There is no excuse. If we can't persuade the rest of the environmental movement, we can't hope to persuade the country as a whole. If we can't u unite uh, the folks that claim to be for the environment to the fact that the nuclear issue is an existential threat to the man and womankind just as great as climate change. I've been at this for 40 years. I have been unable to make a distinction that one is any more awesome or any worse. They're both the most horrible threats that mankind faces. Uh, but the beauty of it is that we have an alternative, namely 100% renewable, that get rid of both of them, and we are not as a group organized uh, to put our emphasis on making the positive case. There is a much better chance of persuading the American people to be for something than to just be against. And, and we, have, we haven't persuaded folks that there is a 100% renewable alternative to both coal and nuclear. It's out there. There have been books written about it. Arjun Makajani's written a book on it. I've written a book on it. Everybody knows that it can be done. But somehow or another, we are now all into our little tunnel visions where we're focused on, you know, and I don't want to diminish any of the scientific studies they've been doing, but every scientist can also be a spokesperson. Uh, I mean, the world has to do, count on people with knowledge to not just do their doctoral papers, but to speak out and to speak to laymen and other people. I mean, I, I, I just think that there needs to be a pledge made by everybody in this room that before you go to another anti-nuclear movement, you will have had 10 people over for coffee in your particular place of living and talk to them about this issue. Because we're not gonna get anywhere just meeting and meeting and meeting and telling ourselves how great we are and how, how worthy we are and how strong we are uh, when we're not when we have a Democratic president who is pro-nuclear and not hearing very much about it from anyone. So I, I, do, th I do think that, what the, that I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist because while Glenn Seaborg was talking about taking atomic energy to go to the moon, it was solar-powered PV cells that took us to the moon. Uh, and, and while uh, these folks talk about their technology, it's it's the solar and the wind and the possibility for storage uh, that has made the breakthroughs. Uh, they are cost effective now. And many states are requiring that they be implemented. And, and I think that if we spend 10 words uh, advocating 100% solar for every word that we spend trying to scare people about things they're not scared about. But let's talk about that radioactive trash and let's hammer home the fact that every nuclear power plant raises your electric rates and, and try to see if we can't get a young female version of Ralph Nader to take the lead here, then we might win.